I'm Greg DePama, and you're listening to Andrew Leanne's Australian Open Shot Clock for this Saturday, the 20th of January, 2018, on the Prime Sports Radio Network with PSN tennis editor and former top 15 player in the world, Andrew Leanne. On today's report, we'll recap third round action from the past two nights, including an epic ladies match we hope you didn't miss. We'll also preview fourth round matches starting tonight, including a huge Curios Dimitrov battle and much more as Andrea Leanne's Australian Open Shot Clock on the Prime Sports Radio Network starts now. All right, Andrea, what can you say about last night's Halep uh, Davis match, except that once again, Simona Halep is proving the doubters wrong about her fight and want in this sport, and sooner or later, She's going to break through and win a slam, so maybe it's time to appreciate the journey and stop criticizing her for the sake of headlines. I agree with you completely. I've always known her as a fighter, a fighter from when she won the juniors at the French Open, and we're just seeing that now. What is The minor miracle in all this is that she's playing with an Achilles tendon mm-hmm. injury. It is super, super painful, Greg. I've had a micro tear once in my Achilles. It almost took my breath away. It's so painful. How she's being able to endure such physical pain, as she says, she can feel the pain every single point. It never goes away. By the end of the match, her whole ankle was numb. And how she's able to endure that and still win a match against Lauren Davis, who is such a tenacious baseliner, makes you hit so many balls, makes you do so much moving. I have no idea how Simone has been able to do that. But it just shows the really undercurrent of her. The It's in her... Um, it's just in her uh, entire being of being able to get out there and fight and fight yep. and fight. Yes, has it improved to become number one in the world? Of course it has. But uh, to be able to endure this uh, just shows the real constitution she has. I don't think we would see any other player in the women's draw able to endure such physical pain and still in uh, being able to win. Um, but we look at the match, Greg. You know, look, she came out there tentative. She did not play well in the beginning. She came out looking very apprehensive about this uh, leg. She was not moving well to it. And Lauren Davis credit her for having a clarity of thought as to what she was yep. going to do. And she went right after that Halep foot. She started hitting that backhand side, usually the strength in Halep's game, that backhand, and went and tested it right from the very first point. You saw exactly what her game plan was going to be, exactly what she was going to do. And she was not going to be – you know, in any way yield to the fact of trying to be nice to Simona about this injury. And truthfully, Greg, uh, Simona was not able to hit through that shot. She was not able to hit her back end. She was not able to move as she always does. And you're talking about a player whose career has been based on this superior foot speed, the ability to move, to feel the ball. And when uh, she feels the ball well, as she says, it's because she's able to move and hit, hit and move so easily. And not there. That is where she had to really be resourceful. She had to think her way out of it, and she had to find another way. And you have to, as you say, give her credit. You know, yes. uh, everyone wants to find some easy storyline and uh, and try and make something out of it. But the truth of the matter is I remember watching these two play uh, a few years back. And if this had been a year ago, Simona would have beaten Lauren Davis because I watched her beat Lauren Davis at Indian Wells. It was her first rounder, Greg. She absolutely cleaned her clock. It was two in love. It was you know over in less than an hour. Mm-hmm. And the way she did it was hit a very, very extensive uh, high top spin shot, far more top spin than she's hitting now. And she was able to open up the court by hitting the top spin shots wide and drawing Davis, who's only 5'2", off the court to open up the other side where she had an easy uh, put away. And she was not hitting that top spin today. She was trying to go for the hard, flat shots. She was hitting a lot up the middle. In the beginning of the match, Greg, she had trouble just getting the ball past the service line, quite frankly. There was not a lot of depth. And that really fed into Lauren Davis because she loves those hard, flat shots. She feeds off pace. She loves to get grooved. She doesn't like to have her rhythm disrupted. And so playing that sort of game really makes Lauren Davis look terrific. But I give both women credit. When you're 15-13 in the third set, uh, of course, this ties the record as the longest set in the Australian Open history. Uh, I mean, what a magnificent uh, display it was for both women to fight it out. Uh, but as you said, Simona Halep now, of course, commanding the stage. We, we thought we'd be talking about Kerber Sharapova. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, how about that? Uh, the fact that she has no clothing sponsor for this event? 
So well, uh, and boy, wouldn't it have been nice to have that sponsor <laughs> on now? Can you imagine all the bells and whistles she would hit uh, uh-huh. with all these uh, with all these wins? Yeah. And of course, to be on TV for I mean that one sec, Greg, was two hours and twenty minutes oh, or yeah. so, and the match almost four hours. I think it was three hours and forty four minutes. So uh-huh. I mean, the exposure that you get with Simona Halep, and I also want to mention three hundred and forty seven uh, direct messengers to me from uh, our Romanian Facebook friends. These people are all over this. I can't tell you the enormous fan base Simona Halep has. And she has always had this. But they are going absolutely crazy because they are so excited for her to be able to pull through this. And whoever signs her should have a T-shirt in that country in two seconds, and they're going to sell millions. Because she has probably, I think, the biggest fan base of any uh, player competing uh, in that tournament today. Now, you mentioned uh, your experience with uh, similar type of injuries, and it's one thing to deal with the injury during the match. It's a completely different thing for her to recoup. Uh, she's got to come back uh, in uh, in a pretty short period of time, not tomorrow, but the day after, and she's got to play. I mean, she's got to go up against Osaka. Uh, so what about what you're expecting from uh, her to deal with in that match? Well, there's a big difference in having an ankle injury and having an Achilles tendon injury. The ankle injury you can play with. I actually had multi-fractures in an ankle once when I played the U.S. Open. They put a soft cast on it, and I got to the round of uh, 16, had to play Martina Navratilova on that Labor Day Monday uh, for CBS. And I really wanted to pull out. I didn't want to play the match because that, by that point my ankle was so swollen I couldn't even fit it in a shoe. Wow. Um, but they put the, they have this numbing spray they can put on it and you don't really feel too much and you tape it up to give it support and on you go. Um, but, uh, by the fourth, uh, round, uh, the round of 16, I really could not move on it. So, uh, she, that's where Simona is now. Um, and I think the Achilles tendon is a much trickier injury and it's much more serious. Uh, you don't want to have a tear there. No, you don't no. want to have a permanent injury there because that will take you out for months yes, and months. Yes. Uh, so this is something she's going to have to look at with her um, you know, medical team and with her uh, you know, tennis team and with her advisors because this is something where, yes, it's great that she's gotten to the fourth round. She will play Osaka, who beat Ash Barty. And Osaka is uh, actually an easier player, I think, for Simona to some respects because you're going to have very quick points. Okay. Very similar to Destiny in the first round where they're both big hitters. Naomi and Destiny hit the ball a ton. They don't like to move. The points are short. Okay. And so it's going to be, again, up to Simona to try and open up the court and move them. But if she can't move herself, I think it's going to be very, very tough. It puts a lot of uh, pressure really on her to get her first serve in and to put a lot of uh, zing on her return to serve to start the point off in control but uh, I, I think that they're going to have to reevaluate after the next day she's going to take tomorrow off as she has been in these days in between uh, but this is a great chance for Naomi Osaka she now is being coached by Sasha Bajan uh, formerly of Carol Wozniacki of Serena Williams of Vika Azarenka so Sasha with that experience eye is really helping Naomi reach her fourth round at the Grand Slam a uh, new experience for her so you know, I think that this is a time where Naomi Osaka is a smart girl, and she also is going to go at this ba- uh, Halep uh, ankle. She's going to go at that backhand yeah. side. And it's the accumulation now of these matches where we're going to have to see if Simona can continue. Yeah, is it, so it's one of those injuries where if she decides to go out there on the court, it's it's going to be like, okay, she's going to feel some pain, discomfort, but it's it's either going to be she's going to she, it's either going to be a tear. Or she's just going to have the discomfort. It's not going to be, well, I might start to uh, – maybe I'll feel it get more uh, uh, painful, and the more painful, the more damaging it is uh, to my knee. Well, that's the real issue is that can she damage this more in the Achilles? Pain signifies to me more damage, and that's not good. That's no. when you have to think about not playing. If it's just numb – and a little bit swollen, which is what a lot of ankle injuries are, they are manageable. You can manage ankle injuries and still continue to play. And if it's numb, you can play on it. There's no pain. The pain is the different thing, and that means that she is damaging it further. So she's going to have to think about that because the one thing I did see in this match, and I have seen in other matches, you know, off the baseline, Halep's lateral movement is second to none. You know, no one moves as well as uh, Simona, even with the injury. She moves as, uh, you know, better than most on the baseline. It's the up and back movement. And she is having trouble uh, off the mark really moving forward. And the drop shots, the short balls have been very difficult for her in this last match. And 
I've also seen that actually in the last six months, and that is she is going to have to start working on that short game of hers, you know, how to handle the short balls, how to handle the drop shots, um, how to handle the the passing shot. She really was unable to pass Laura Davis five feet two inches tall when Laura was a Lauren was a sitting duck at net. So this is the type of thing where in the future she will work on. But right now we have to consider that this uh, angle really is factored into how she uh, has had to play every shot, and it's really a it's really um, been uh, quite of a, a test of survival. Sure. Who is been the most resourceful. Uh, so uh, right now, even though we still have to get both Pliskova and Hal through their next matches, you would have to you'd have to say that Pliskova has the edge going into the rest of the tournament. I think just anyone because she's has healthier. the edge over Hal now yeah. because of this physical injury. And look, da- look, Lauren Davis, who's now ranked, you know, in the 70s, she was ranked as high as 26, Greg, and she has an interesting story. You uh, never came out in that she has really gone through quite a journey herself in the last couple of years. You know, at five two, I remember <laughs> as I said, watching her Indian Wells when she first turned pro because uh Bob Kane from IMG was a big supporter of her. She comes from the Cleveland area. And uh so we went out to I went out there to watch her and see how she was gonna able to forge a career with, you know, obviously limitations physically. And you had to give her a lot of credit. She's so tenacious mentally. But in the last couple of years she has uh, been working with Brenda Schultz McCarthy and her husband Sean because you know she felt that she had sacrificed so much in her life and she's had to do everything with the work ethic and everything to maximize the you know the limitations that she has that she wasn't having a lot of fun and it was just work 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 and she was uh, sacrificing her whole life she felt so she went to them and they were able to find try and find a better balance and it was the beginning of last year that she really had some of her best results and why she rose to 26 in the world she won Auckland did lose in the first round of the Australian, and then did well in the uh, Doha and Dubai events, but uh, then really uh, plateaued and uh, had a string of first round losses, and which ended the year on a very kind of mediocre note. So, you know, you look at these players, and they all have had their journeys, and they've all had to come around to finding what the right balance is for them. Uh, for me right now, I, th- I think for Simona Halb, it's really about uh, if she is she doing more damage to this Achilles uh, yeah. tendon. And I'll tell you right now, I mean, if if the doctors say, look, uh, it could happen, it could not happen, and 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 the best thing for her is to rest. She's got to rest. She has to, in my mind. I mean, I don't know about taking the chance. You know, I mean, if this well, was the final, I, you know, that's going to be up to her. You know, at this point, it's like someone says, "What happened?" You know, analyze the match fifteen thirteen. You know, when someone wins a match 15-13, you know, you got to just salute them, give them mm-hmm. 100% credit. And Simona deserved 100% credit for winning that match. And anyone who doesn't get give her credit for that, shame on them. And uh, let me tell you, to pull off what she did in these last three matches has been superhuman. Mm-hmm. And But it's going to be up to her. And at the end of the day, it's her gut instinct yep. as to what she can do and what she wants to do. It's her career. It's her body. And she's got to make that decision. All right. And by the way, you've been critical before about these marathon final sets. Uh, and, and we've seen them, of course, in the Grand Slams. So, uh, it, I mean, what do you think? I mean, is it do you think uh, maybe if somebody gets gets injured in one of these really long marathon matches, they might consider changing the, the, the rule? Uh, or are you OK with that? Or you say, OK, it's a couple times a year. You know, it, it is what it is. Well, we haven't seen this too often, uh, 15, 13. So it's not really a, a major issue on the women's tour. I think it was more of an issue on the men's tour where you have these three out of five set matches uh, televised that are over five hours. And this was happening quite a bit. Okay. And it was just too long for the viewer, too long for the mainstream viewer. And especially uh, through the television uh, broadcast. And you were just losing too many kids, too many uh uh, general audience types of uh, uh, interest and, okay. and corporate interest. So that was where that uh, topic came up. I don't think it's as much of an issue for the women. If we see more 15, 13 sets, <laughs> right. possibly. But um, right now, I think that there's so many issues right now, Greg, because, of course, there was the heat issue, and then and then there's the prize money issue, and then there's this major general issue is who is advocating for the players over there? Who is advocating for the women and the men? And Novak Djokovic, who has made such a subject of this, is now paying the price. They won't put him on labor. They've put him on the outside uh, arenas now for his matches. Really? They put Sasha Zarev on twice. Uh, the guy who they thought he was going to have to play to give Sasha Zarev kind of a little bit of an edge to get used to labor. Okay. Of course, Novak's played there quite a bit, having taken the title a few times, Greg. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> a number of times in the past. 
But it's just, it was a little bit of a snub, and Novak's feeling that snub. And uh, but this is what happens when you go and you start questioning authority in the game. <laughs> uh, you 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 get your uh, you get your consequences. But oh, uh, this has become a prevalent issue over who is advocating for the players and why is there no player union? Why is there no separate entity to advocate for the players? Yeah, I mean, I hear I, I heard John McEnroe uh, bring that up the other day, and and I, you know the first thing that I say to myself is. You know, you have all these uh, big na- – I mean, maybe Roger's a guy that they could turn to when he retires. But you get so many uh, name uh, athletes in tennis and men, women, and, and they have money and they have power. And you just say, OK, well, why do you just keep bringing this up? Why don't you do something about it? I mean, those are the guys and, and the ladies that have to do something about it are the ones with name recognition and power. Uh, so why well, do- and of course, as you say that, uh, this whole uh, conversation has taken a completely different tone when Roger Federer came out a couple days ago and in his post-match press said, hey, I don't think Novak so off the mark on this Grand Slam prize money issue. Okay. And I think it should be discussed. There you so go. now that Roger has said something, yep, yep. it's all of a sudden a different, uh, different type of uh, topic. And yes. now everyone's starting to rethink, you know, maybe Novak is right. Maybe the players do need even some sort of advocacy type of entity out there to, for them. You can't depend on the tours to do that. There's too much politics. There's too much circling of the wagons to protect your territory and to protect your, you know, tours territory. And there's no one there just singly advocating for the players. Yeah. Well, somebody's going to do it sooner or later. And uh, it's got to be somebody like Roger to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to be able to uh, be the voice, get the respect of both parties, and get. This. I mean, we will say technically the tours are supposed to be the one. The tour managers on site are supposed to deal with the weather issues and other mm-hmm. uh, issues that happen uh, come up during the event of the Grand Slams. So the tours are supposed to be doing that. So what the players are really saying is the tours aren't doing a good job of it. Sure, and uh, and and there is, like you said, because there's too much politics and there's uh, a, a lot of that going on, uh, where you also have. Uh, you know, whether it's sponsors or events. Conflicts of interest. Yes. And uh, that's the word I was looking for. And uh, that is not good for the players. And so the players have got to change that. And it'll happen. It will happen. It's just a matter of at least this is now the beginning stages of it happening. Somebody just eventually has got to get it done and take charge. Uh, you mentioned Kerber, uh, and we thought maybe <laughs> this was going to be the match to talk about and start the show with. But that's uh, the reason we didn't do that was not only because of Simona Halep's huge win, but also because Kerber just destroyed Maria. Uh, and, you know, we talked early on in our preview show about her chances, Kerber's chances, and uh, you, you liked them an awful lot. I, I went ahead and even put money on her to win the championship two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. That's how confident I was. And how can you not feel even more confident the way she's playing? What a year a difference makes. From 2016, number one in the world, a horrible 2017, couldn't buy a match, couldn't buy a win. And now, of course, is the favorite for the title, having come and just demolished Maria Sharapova in just over an hour. And it wasn't even that close, Greg. Uh, it, it was just absolutely perfect tennis from Angie Kerber. She came on with the fight and the physical prowess. She had all the answers. There was nothing Maria could do to really make a dent. And you have to give Angie credit because this is what she went and did in her offseason, Greg. She yeah. said, look, I'm not going through another year. Everyone's written me off. Everyone's dismissed me. I've taken more snubs this year than anyone can imagine, and I'm not going to put up with it anymore. I'm going to show them. So, again, the hunger, the desire came back to regain the physicality, and that is the difference. As Andre Agassi once said, the fitter I got, the smarter I played. And that is why I think Angie has so much confidence now. The legs are back. The arms are back. The speed, the foot speed. Um, she's not able, she was able to absorb Maria's power, but then again, boomerang it right back in her face and use it and feed off it and put it right back out there and take the ball early and redirect it. So Maria had no time to catch up to it because Maria does not move well on that baseline, as we've mentioned. And Maria, you know, people keep asking, especially on our Facebook, why is she not playing as well as she did years ago? First of all, she is over 30, but so is Angie. Angie just turned 30 herself. And uh, so they know each other well, 
But Maria has no defense. Everything is one gear, Mach 5, a winner trying to hit a winner off of everything. And, you know, when you have 25 unforced errors and only about half the number of winners, that's not going to do it. And at some point, Maria has to decide at this stage in her career if she wants to change her thinking a bit and how mm-hmm. she plays points. Yeah. And I don't know if that's going to happen, Greg. You know, at this stage in their career, as Maria said herself in her press, it's hard to make changes. It's hard to change your mindset. It's hard to do things sure. differently when you've been winning and doing it the way you've been doing it your entire career. And But, you know, I go back to the old Landstorp way of uh, training. And, of course, he worked with three Grand Slam champions, with Tracy Austin, Lindsay Davenport, and Maria. And they all had the same type of approach. He'd bring a shopping cart of balls out, thousands of balls, and he would feed them and put the targets up. And he said, you hit these targets. And he ran you side to side to side, hundreds of balls, making you attack every single one. And you had to attack them. There was no defense in this training. It was total attack. 24-7 24-7 all the time, and that's the way Maria is playing. She feels she has to attack every single ball and hit a winner off of every single one, and it's just unfortunately uh, impossible because she's not in position all the time. She's not moving well enough to be in position to have such a low percentage of uh, margin over the net, and that's why you're seeing so many unforced errors. So it's up to Maria to say, hey, I got to you know evolve some sort of defense in my game and that means if I'm out of position I got to learn to put the ball up deep put it back defensively and wait again and work the point around so I get the right shot to go for it. And I don't know if she's going to do that. The serve of course um you know technically she is hitting the serve she is meeting the ball as it's dropping not at its height meaning she's not getting the arm and the shoulder up through the through the shot and it's just very erratic. The most interesting stat is even though she got 63% of her first serves in, she only won 38% of the points. So even when she's getting that hard flat shot in, it's not phasing the the players of a caliber of Angie Kerber. They're seeing it, they're reading it, and they're there to receive it uh, and hit winners off of it. So this is another issue for Maria. Is she going to learn to start changing up the serve, have a different spin, hit some different slices, you know, do something different? Um, I don't know at this stage if she wants to do that. And, of course, she has such big business off-court. She's made so much money. She has a huge brand, and she doesn't have to do it. But if she wants to win matches and get her ranking up and try and achieve some of these on-court goals, she's going to have to do that. Well, no one ever said having a second successful career uh, was going to be easy. So uh, it's hard. And uh, that's the thing. She, it, does she want to uh, put in the time and the effort? Uh, we'll find well, out. Well, you know, I will tell you, though, it can be done. I remember when Chris Everett, uh, late in her career, could oh, not yeah. beat Martina Nartolova. And we've, got, we've talked about this before. Yep. And she couldn't beat Martina. That was the only person, really, uh, her rival that was ahead of her. And it really got to her. And I have to give her such enormous credit and respect for the fact that she went back to the drawing board and she improved herself physically. She got stronger. She got faster. She got into better shape shape. And I think just that physical prowess gave her the mindset that she could be more aggressive. She could even come to net and she could take the initiative with Martina. And sure enough, she went back in the gym and after doing all this work, you know, you know, work she really didn't want to do, you know, here she had this very feminine, very, you know, um, model-esque figure on, on tour uh-huh. uh, and, and that she presented so well as American uh, apple pie type of image. And and then she went back to the gym to really build the muscle she needed to beat Martina. And that took a lot of courage and a lot of risk, and it paid off, though. She came back. She did beat Martina. So it can be done. Yeah. Maria can do this. It's a question whether she's willing to. All right. Now, uh, it looks like Kerber, the way she's playing, will find herself uh, in the quarters against either Keys or Garcia in what should be a really good match, especially now that Garcia – uh, is, uh, is is looking like she's healthy. Uh, of course, Keyes is just storming along. So uh, I, I know you talked about this in our preview show of the event, that you like Keyes to, to make it uh, as far as the semifinals possibly. So, uh, well, what they're do you both think? great shot makers, aren't they? They have huge uh, power, huge weapons, and they rely on that. Um, I think that Garcia moves a slight bit better than Keys, but I think Keys now is much more mentally tougher than Garcia. And I'm looking at, for Keys to you know feel that she has something to prove. She was in the top ten. She's not there now. She had those two wrist surgeries that really held her back last year. But I think she's pull, put it all together. She has a great team. Lindsay Davenport, fantastic. 
really has uh, primed her for the occasion perfectly. And uh, I do think that Garcia, as you said, she's gotten through her matches, but she's had much, much tougher times. You know, she's gone three sets last couple, and uh, whereas Keys has just absolutely flown by. She has not had one issue at all. She is playing beautiful tennis. She did get a great draw, we will say that. Um, and, uh, you know, with Milanovic uh, out of that, mm-hmm. the seat out of her uh, part of the draw, she really has had uh, no one really uh, tough to test her. But um, she will be tested by Garcia because G- Garcia is a shot maker. She's got a good game. She's got confidence. And when she gets in her zone, she is tough. So it's going to be up for Keys to come out there and uh, you know, really shut her down in the beginning, Greg. And I think it's really important for Madison to serve well and to wait again for the right shot to go for the winner, but she's got to take control of the match from the beginning and shut Garcia down. And then, of course, uh, if, if she's able to knock off Garcia, uh, next standing by would be Kerber, and that could be uh, huge. What a huge match that could be. Uh, you know, I was looking at the draws uh, this morning, and uh, I, I went through this half draw, and I was like, wow, that's only a half a draw? <laughs> and then I realized the other half a draw, and I was like, well, this isn't so hard the way things have worked out. Uh, if you look at Wozniacki and Svitolina, I mean, are we not going to get a Svitolina Wozniacki semifinal match? Looks like it. And I think in that match, you would favor Svitolina, who has beaten Caroline a number of times. Actually, Caroline's taken a number of losses to uh, players in that part. Uh, Suarez Navarro has beaten her at the French Open last year, I saw. So Caroline has a tendency as um, you know, the draw gets further on into the second week to get a little bit more fatigued because she's doing all the running. She's doing all the work. She's trying to outlast her opponents from the baseline. Now, I will say in the last round, Greg, uh, we did see a more uh, edgier Carolyn Wozniacki, <laughs> right. and she definitely looked more aggressive, and she definitely was taking the initiative, and I'm glad to see that. Um, I, you know, it almost suggested, I think, uh, to the camp that they go and find John Macro because I give John Macro a huge assist in Caroline's uh, return to uh, number two in the world last fall after that horrendous U.S. Open where she was uh, very indignant about being put on an outside court, lost in that first round of Makarova, and uh, really was uh, feeling the wounds of all that and pride. And so she went out with John uh, in New York and started hitting with John at his academy and I think that really turned it around for her. It gave her a mojo. It gave her impetus to really go out and, and grab these wins. And I think that he's over there, and it would have been good for her to go out on her off day and hit with John because <laughs> he's just the kind of guy, Greg, that just gives you mojo no sure, matter what. Yeah. Just being around him, you know, the intensity, the strive for excellence, you know, the wanting to win, all that just translates so well to everyone he's with. It was Jack Stock at the Labor Cup and Caroline, of course, after the Open. And uh, I did, you did see a different Caroline in her last round against Burton's, and she was much feistier. And that's the Caroline that's going to be needed if she wants to win this title or beat Spitalina. Uh, she's going to have to be feisty. She's going to have to be tough. And she's going to have to play defense, offense a lot more. Uh, she cannot just play defense. You know, we talk about the players who have no defense. She has no offense, and she does. she's capable of it, but she just doesn't want to do it. And so that's what it's going to take. This is a fast court. It favors the offensive players who can take the initiative and be aggressive. And uh, in her next match, uh, that's what she's going to have to do. And uh, now Svitolina is, by the way, it's interesting because she's won eight straight matches since uh, the Brisbane win, and uh, it's possible that she might be going up against uh, Mertens. Uh, who's also won right now eight straight matches after winning in Hobart. So I would think that Mertens is the favorite to face Svitolina. But again, Svitolina, this is her shot to get to the semis for the first time in a slam. I agree, and I think that she's tasting that. and She can feel it. She knows that this is an opportunity. She has had a great draw, and she's gotten better and better. Whatever the you know medical malady was at the beginning of the tournament seems to have faded. And she seems to be more herself now. She seems more relaxed and happier to be in the second week. And, uh, yeah, I think that she has feels much more of a foundation now in her place in the seedings and her place in the draw. And I think she's very happy to see, you know, players like Ostapenko go out. We saw Ostapenko go out to Condovite in a uh, battle of the baseline bashers. And uh, I, I think that watching Coco and Ostapenko uh, leave the draw early uh, really has given both Caroline and Alina a lot of impetus for going through. All right, now let's talk about uh, the big fourth round match on the men's side. We were uh, hoping we'd get when the tournament began. We circled it. Kyrgios and Dimitrov. Here we are. 
it's obvious uh, watching the matches that Kyrgios is playing better right now than Dimitrov. And that's more just of that Dimitrov seems to have been struggling a little bit more than we thought he would over his last couple of matches, even though Rublev is a good player. And, and by the way, that kid is going to be really good. I mean, that is one talented player. But And Kyrgios had his hands full against Sanga. There's no question about that. Uh, but uh, what do you think? Has your mind changed at all? I know you gave the edge to Curios. No, the it doesn't beginning. change at all. I watched the Sanga uh, Curios match. What a phenomenal match! And I have give such credit to uh, Nick. I mean, he really held his composure. He's had to deal with so much. You know, the crazy fans and the all the distractions and the noise and this and that. There have been so many different external cues that could have disturbed him and really uh, prevented him from, you know staying calm, mm -hmm. staying focused, but he has held firm, he's kept it all together, and he's shown a real maturity out on court. And you can tell he wants it, Greg. That's, the reason is, is because he wants it. He was playing one of his childhood heroes, Sangha. He tells a story about how when he was little and he went out to the court, Sangha was playing there, and he would uh, bring a different ball out every day for Sangha to sign, and Sangha signed every single one, about 25 balls. <laughs> so he has great uh, reverence for Sangha, but not enough to not to beat him. <laughs> sure. And uh, it was an interesting thing because he was down in that four set break or yeah. five two yeah. and hung in there and the you know the old nick probably would have given it up yep. and said okay let's see about the fifth let's see if i can hang in there for the fifth but he you know he said no and he got very crafty very resourceful and he's so talented that he has the ability to you know change a match on a dime so he's got the big serve he also has he you know he can be a counter puncher he can come up with the passing shots he can move uh he's got it all he's the most dangerous player on the tour which is why um, I, I gave him a shot to win this title. I do think he'll beat Dimitrov. He's got too many weapons, too explosive, and he wants it too badly. Whereas Dimitrov is in and out. Uh, we've seen him you know, playing some good tennis, but not great tennis this uh, last week. And he's had some tough matches where he's been able to eke them out, but really hasn't shown the drive that we saw at the London uh, finals last year. Yeah, uh, I mean, you could you could excuse the Rublev match, but, you know, back to back against the, uh, you know, the upstart American uh, in the second round. Uh, that's just asking. I think, a little too, yeah, yeah, I, I and I think that, um, you know, this is where you have to say, uh, you know, where is uh, Grigor's mindset? And, you know, he's been the bridesmaid so long. He's been in the supporting role so long. And now at a Grand Slam, does he have it to really go and take it to Nick? And uh, it'll be interesting because this is the next-gen group. Now, this is not facing Rafa as he did last year where you're facing, you know, the, the heavyweight champion. Yeah. This is where you're facing someone in your generation. And uh, to me, I just feel that Nick has too many weapons, is too explosive with his game, and will have too much uh, as far as um, the overall – spectrum of the match now you know three out of five i think they're about the same i i will tell you i think playing doubles has helped nick Kyrgios stay in shape okay. and stay fit and that is why we're seeing him not tire in these four set matches like he like against sangai he was fresh he was okay he was not tired so that was the one thing we were worried about could he last in the three out of five set match if it went the distance and uh, i think he can and that's where I think he wants it so much. He's going to put it all together. And just the pride that Nick has in his game. You know, I think we forget he does have ego. He has that pride. And uh, I don't think he's going to want to lose this one. Yeah, we still believe. And uh, he just beat Dimitrov, too. No, that's true. You know, after Dimitrov beat him uh, before that. So uh, this is uh, this is the one that is going to break uh, the tie there. And. Uh, everybody's looking forward to it. Should be great, and we would uh, we would expect the winner to get to the semifinals. Not saying that the quarterfinal match will be easy. Edmund, the Brits playing well. Seppi's won eight straight after winning the Challenger, but with Sock out, with Anderson out, and of course Edmund knocked off Anderson. Uh, we would have to believe that uh, that this is this Dimit Dimitrov Kyrgios match uh, is uh, is going to be the decider for who gets to the semis. That's, right, because of course in the other part we're we're looking at <laughs> Novak and Chung. That's now the big match since Sasha Zara have lost to. Chung, uh, and I watched that as well. And we talked about, we were curious how Curious would do in a three out of five if it went to di the distance. Uh, we said the same thing about Sasha Zarev. It's been the nemesis for him in these Grand Slam events. He just has not had the fortitude to be able to have anything left in that last set. And sure enough, 6 0, the Chung went down oh. uh, like a fly and yep. just it really put up no, no offense at all, nothing. And, uh, to me, it wasn't the physical, though, Greg. It was not the physical issue. I think Jez Green does have him in shape. I think he is physically fit, and okay. he could have physically done it. This is mental. 
And uh, to me, he just collapsed in that match after the middle of the fourth set and just never recovered. Well, why do you think it's mental? What is it about his personality <laughs> and maturity uh, that you've noticed over the last couple of years that leads you to believe he's got a long way to go in that department? Well, I, he does work hard, so let's put that out there. He's a hard worker, not as hard as uh, Dominic team and a few others, but he does work hard. Personally, I think that everything has come very easy for Sasha Zarev, though, as relative as that is. Okay. I think he's gotten to three in the world very quickly. I, he's been given a lot of attention, a lot of expectation, and uh, I think he's look, reading his headlines a little bit too much. I think he needs to back up and really do the work mentally in what it takes. Uh, I, look, I would have him go and train with Rafa for a couple weeks, <laughs> and yeah. then he could really see the level you need in a mentality to uh, win a Grand Slam. I don't think he knows what that is yet. You cannot quit uh, – in the fourth set of a match like that and expect to win a slam, no one's going to give it to him. And I think a lot has been given to Sasha Zarev. But uh, when you get to that stage of a match against Chong, who, you know, look, he's hungry. He wants it. Sure. Uh, this is his grand slam, you know, the Asian grand slam. Um, you, you know, no one's going to give it to Sasha. He's got to go out and get it himself. And that's the hunger and drive I'm not seeing so much from him in these grand slams. And by the way, congratulations to Chung, because you got to believe that, you know, winning the next gen finals last year without Zverev there. Oh, yeah, but, but Sasha wasn't there. And so that I'm sure had to affect him a little bit. Yeah, I won the next gen title, but Sasha wasn't here. And then he goes out and he beats Sasha the way that he does. That's got to feel so good. His his confidence has got to be through the roof. And congratulations to him because well, I, don't think I think when you put in the work and you prepared well as he did in Thailand, he, as he said, very hot, humid conditions. So wasn't really phased by anything uh, that's been going on this week with the weather. I think when you put in the hard work and you know you've done everything you can, you come prepared. You're you're able to fight that much more, and you feel you deserve to win. And I think that Chung felt that he deserved to beat Sasha, that he, you know, had worked harder than Sasha. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually don't think Sasha had a great off season. You know, he said he went into the Hotman Cup usually five weeks in, and this time it was only two weeks in. So he was trying to play his way into shape, match tough shape, and I don't think he really got there. Yeah, well, he was only one in three in the Hotman Cup, so it wasn't like he was winning matches there either. So... You know, that's... Yeah, he was cruising there. He was on cruise control. And you can't be on cruise control and win Grand Slams. But uh, one person who's not on cruise control is Novak Djokovic. So I'm still picking Novak to come out of there. I think okay. that Chung will give him a good match. I, can Chung win? Of course he can. But I still think Novak looks absolutely uh, terrific out there. He's very smooth. He did have an injury timeout for his hip. Doesn't seem to be a big deal. He's got the sleeve on the arm, that elbow injury we talked about. It's a preventative uh measure but um he looked very good and i think the fact that he's been snubbed uh this past week has really given impetus to uh win the title all right and then uh that would be of course uh novak against chung uh in the fourth round and dominic team against the american sangren uh in the fourth round uh what do we know about this sangren uh fellow uh is this somebody 96th in the world so uh does he have a shot <laughs> against team and the only american left in the men's draw. <laughs> yeah, right. Who would have got Who, who would have, who would have that? thought? Um, you know, look, I give him credit. He's very resourceful. He's crafty. He uh, he has uh, put together a great streak. Um, you know, I don't think it will go much further, but uh, I think that he has done a great job. You give him credit. This is a guy, a journeyman, who is, you know, no one really thought he'd have much of a career, and he's, he's uh, proved them all wrong. So it just shows you you can have different paths to the top. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, to make the second week of a Grand Slam is certainly a, a goal he oh, yeah. should be proud of. Um, yeah. I think the fact that Del Potro lost uh, is really what people are looking at to uh, Burdage. Uh, has opened the draw for Federer, though, and I think Federer will continue to cruise uh, in his part. And I think we're still looking at a Federer-Novak uh, you know, semifinal. Yeah, I think the only thing that uh, that you, you can throw in there uh, if, uh, if we get Federer-Burdage is going to be the fact that uh, let's not forget what happened with Burdage in Miami last year. Uh, the good part is, is he almost and should have beat Roger. Uh, the bad news is uh, he didn't. And in the way he that he almost should have, could have uh, many times against Roger, <laughs> and he just never does. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he I, once in a while. But he, uh, I remember watching him play Roger um, at the Australian, uh, and uh, he, he always gets to that point where he can. Uh, you know, put has the match in hand and then she can't close out. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's the psychological edge of playing Roger. Roger mm -hmm. just has that little bit more of a mental edge on him. And I feel that will come into play. Also, if this is a night match, I think that will also help Roger. 
Um, but uh, he has a more of an all-court game. He can come into net. He can take advantage, put pressure on Burdage. And, uh, look, Burdage is the entail of his career, too. So he's hungry. He's been in the top ten. He has experience. So can he do it? Of course he can. But uh, I, don't think, um, I don't think he will this time either. All right. Sounds good, Andrea. So when we come back, uh, it'll be Monday, and we'll be able to preview the quarterfinals. So uh, we have uh, three more shows to go, preview the quarters, the semis, and then, of course, the championship. So thanks a lot for taking your uh, time out of your Saturday after being up all night watching tennis. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll talk to you again in a couple of days. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Andrea. All right. That's Andrea Leanne of Greg De Palma. Thanks again uh, for tuning in uh, to our tennis coverage of the Australian Open. Uh, again, we'll be back on Monday. Three more shows to go before this uh, big event, this big Grand Slam is over. Uh, and uh, we'll be here to update everything to get you ready for uh, the next match, which is, again, coming up the big one tonight. Kyrgios and Dimitrov, we're all going to be tuned in. We'll talk about that in a couple of days and all the other matches and then preview the quarters on Monday. Thanks for tuning in to Andrea Leanne's Shot Clock on the Prime Sports Radio Network.